All right. Everybody ready? Yeah. It's a pleasure to be back in the Weaver Chapel. Happy Sabbath. Good to see everybody. Um, I suppose I'm going to disclose the topic of study today, and then we'll pray. So it's, it's quite relevant, uh, especially regarding the Sabbath school lesson, but uh, it'll be God's true Israel. So we're learning who is God's true Israel, what is God's true Israel, what is his plan for his people, and so on. So you can join me in prayer if you'd like. You good? Okay. Gracious Father, we just want to praise you and worship you for who you are, because you are worthy to be praised, and we just thank you for the gift of the Sabbath, the refreshing. And Father, there's so much for us to learn, and so much more for us to unlearn. I pray, Father, that you'd enlighten our minds and give us a humble and teachable spirit today. Father, I just pray you take the edge off of the week. Sometimes we come into the Sabbath uh, just with tension, and, and uh, we just pray that you would take that edge off. Help us to just, just have that freedom that your spirit gives to us. And I just pray that you'd comfort our hearts, that you'd lead us into all truth, that you'd give us discernment, that you would help us to be long-suffering and, and willing to just uh, hear your word. And Father, I just pray that you'd be glorified today and that you would speak through me and lead us as we discuss these uh, vital principles from your word. We thank you in the name of your dear son. Amen. 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 Yeah, so it's quite a rele relevant topic because I've been passing some churches, you know, on the way here and just living daily life, driving by, and it'll have signs on the churches which say, pray for Israel. Yeah. And is it a bad idea to pray for Israel? Of course no. not, you know. It's good to pray for Israel. We should. But why don't the, why don't the signs also say, you know, pray for Palestine, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. So there's, there's areas on both sides that are losing their life. There's a lot of suffering that's happening. But, you know, naturally what happens is, you know, we lean towards this idea that there's some inherent holiness to Israel, like it's God's covenant people, and that there is this pervading uh, reality that Israel is the holy land. My question for us is, what makes a place, a person, a thing holy? The presence of God. Okay, so the presence of God. And so that's an interesting idea, um, but we'll, we'll dig more into that in a little bit. So, you know, there's this emphasis, this big emphasis on this being a holy war. And of course, all wars are holy because we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against spirits and principalities and powers um, in high places, right? So we, we don't wrestle against flesh and blood. God, is, God and his angels are fighting for us. He's fighting to save us from the destructive influences of fallen angels and evil men. So, you know, I, I just want to look at this a little bit because... Um, there's a tremendous pressure on the Judeo-Christian, Judeo-Christian, you know, frame of mind that are you going to stand with Israel? Are you going to stand with Israel and, and take your stand? And I just want to look at what does that mean? And uh, I think we can maybe come to a, hopefully a conclusion at the end of this study and what that means. Um, so, yeah, some, just generally speaking, um, you know, there's this, there's this very much this Protestant view that, yes, God's chosen people is Israel. And they have, uh, yes, sir, go ahead. I think we need to start out understanding that the country named Israel is not Israel. It's That's Judah. right. Right. Yeah. There are 12 tribes, and most of them are probably right here. <laughs> <laughs> yes, the scattering and the gathering, yeah. But like you said, it is a place on a map that people turn their eyes to that they perceive that there's some inherent special thing about it. And of course, all places, all, all things, all, all, I should say all people are special to God, right? He's appealing to the conscience. He's wanting to reach anyone and everyone he can. So I don't want to undermine that, but sometimes we exalt one thing because we have these preconceived ideas. So just looking at some of the messianic uh, beliefs, which kind of lead to this idea of, of, I guess, exalting Israel. Um, the messianic kind of m movement often has a lot of um, a lot of a melting pot of different ideas and and views. As you have many Christians who come out of some of the apostate churches, 
and they basically find the Sabbath. They find that God's law is not arbitrary. It's a blessing. And so they, they start to have ideas. And so basically you have this, these people coming out of these churches who want to worship and, and get to know Yeshua, the Son of God, and also observe the Sabbath and whatnot. And you have this, these, all these different ideas. So you don't have a lot of consistency within like the, the Messianic um, faith, I, I should say. So just, I'm just going to share a few of my concerns with that. This tends to lean towards more Jewish culture rather than uh, the Bible. And it, they promote the traditions of men rather than the word of God. You know, we see this time and time again. Um, we see that uh, there's some covenant issues. Oh, that was for the Israel of old. This is for us now. And uh, we'll get more into that in a little bit. And then naturally, the eyes, as I'm sharing, are being turned to physical Israel. And this is an issue because and when I say physical Israel, yes, the country, the, the nation um, that has been uh, revived in recent uh, decades. And then my, my, my concern with this is that there's a danger of accepting a false or the false Messiah, the Antichrist, which is to come at the end of the age, um, which I believe will be through um, the ministration of Satan appearing as a, you know, the, as a son of God, ultimately. Um, so that's my, that's my concern, but in the, in the encouraging part is Jesus says, my sheep hear my voice. So we're going to know, um, we're going to be able to have discernment. And so uh, I do see a lot of emphasis on looking to, to physical Israel, the temple being rebuilt a third time, you know, the Matthew 24 scenario, the abomination that makes desolate. I think there's just a lot of misunderstanding about that. So... I just pray that we'll all have discernment to kind of navigate and ride out these, these waves that are coming. Um, and then also the religion of the heart. You know, we don't, we're not a works-based religion. We should have a heart-based religion. We should have a spirituality that is connected to the God of heaven, you know, where we obey him, we keep his word, we, we keep his commandments, we walk in his statutes and judgments out of a love for his son. So... Um, that's just kind of a, a preface to some things. But I want to look at this, uh, this topic, God's true Israel, from the perspective of, of, of a vineyard. And so turn with me to Psalm chapter 80. This is a really nice angle to look at because it has a lot to say about this. Psalm chapter 80, verses 14 to 19. <clears throat> It says, return, we beseech you, O God of hosts, look down from heaven and behold and visit this vine and the vineyard which thy right hand hath planted and the branch that thou madest strong for thyself. It is burnt with fire. It is cut down. They perish at the rebuke of your presence. Let your hand be upon the man of thy right hand, upon the son of man whom you made strong for yourself. So will not we go back from thee? Quicken us, and we will call upon thy name. Turn us again, O Lord, God of hosts. Cause thy face to shine, and we shall be saved. So who planted this vineyard? God planted it. God's son planted it, right? And then we have in Isaiah a continuation of these thoughts. Isaiah chapter 5. Isaiah chapter 5, verses 1 through 7. There's a really beautiful portion of scripture here. Now will I sing to my well-beloved a song of my beloved touching his vineyard. My well-beloved hath a vineyard in a very fruitful hill. And he fenced it and gathered out the stones thereof and planted it with the choicest vine and built a tower in the midst of it and also made a wine press therein, and he looked that it should bring forth grapes, and it brought forth wild grapes. And now, O inhabitants of Jerusalem and men of Judah, judge, I pray you, between me and my vineyard. What could have been done more to my vineyard that I have not done in it? Wherefore, when I look that it should bring forth grapes, brought it forth wild grapes? What are you getting out of this passage? So God planted the vineyard, 
And who does the vineyard represent? Israel. Israel. Yeah, he even says Jerusalem, Judah. So, and God, naturally, when you come to a vineyard, what do you expect? Fruit. Fruit, okay. Yeah, we'll, we'll look more at that. And, you know, Jesus, he studied the scriptures. He knew the scriptures very well. He quoted from Isaiah very often. I want to take us to a passage in Matthew 21. There's also something profound there. Yes, please. The, with the appeal, it's like, you know, God appealing to his people, what more could I have done or should I have done? Yeah. It also teaches us, I mean, kind of what I was alluding to, that this is what happens when we have complete freedom. We can, God has done everything. He did everything for Lucifer before he fell and became Satan. There was nothing right. that he didn't do to give him love and freedom, and yet he rebelled. Okay. There's nothing that God didn't do for his people originally with Israel, and yet they rebelled. Yeah. Because of freedom, because he loves us. So he's like, I'm willing to risk you rebelling against me because I love you, which yeah. is hard for us to comprehend that. Yeah, thank you. And he, what he's saying is like, I've given you the most fertile soil. I've given you a wall of protection. I've done everything I can do to make it a prosperous opportunity for you to thrive and do well and, and basically be fruitful, which we understand to be really to, to teach the nations about the true God of heaven. Is that right? Mm -hmm. So, so it's not basically saying like there's nothing he could have done more to prevent a lot of grapes coming out. Right, yeah. Yeah. right, right. right. Yeah. Yeah. But it's even in, in the wild grapes is a... Is a um, We'll look more at that regarding like the Gentiles and things like that. I, I think that um, basically I've done everything I can do. Like I've, I've, I've given my people the best opportunity and they have shut me down. But the, the wild grapes have borne fruit, meaning the people who weren't originally grafted in and had that protection, if that makes sense. So it'll, it'll become clear as we go. So Matthew 21, 20, uh, 33 to 43, we'll read these 10 verses and we'll be blessed because... You'll see uh, some parallels here. <clears throat> so it says, 30, uh, 21, 33 to 43. He says, hear another parable. There was a certain householder which planted a vineyard and hedged it round about and digged a wine press in it and built a tower and let it out to husbandmen and went into a far country. So he's quoting directly from Isaiah 5 pretty much. You know, you plant a vineyard, you build a fence around it, you build a tower and a wine press. And so the, the Pharisees, Sadducees would be very familiar with these, with these concepts. Verse 34, and when he, the time of the fruit drew near, he sent his servants to the husbandmen that they might receive the fruits of it. And the husbandmen took his servants and beat one and killed another and stoned another. Again, he sent other servants more than the first. And they did unto them the likewise. But last of all, he sent unto them his son. Another account says his beloved son, his well-beloved son. They will reverence my son. But when the husbandmen saw the son, they said among themselves, this is the heir. Come, let us kill him and let us seize on his inheritance. And they caught him and they cast him out of the vineyard and slew him. When the Lord, therefore, of the vineyard cometh, what will he do unto those husbandmen? And notice in this account, the, the people listening answered him. Well, they will, they, they will, he will obviously miserably destroy those wicked men and let, let out his vineyard unto other husbandmen, which shall render him the fruits in their seasons. Uh, out of your own mouth I will judge you, right? That's the principle, because they see this unjust experience that the, the, the owner of the vineyard is, going on, is, is experiencing. And Christ is trying to bring the parallel to this. Israel, I've given you such an opportunity to thrive and prosper. I've sent my prophets to you when you've fallen into idolatry, but you've stoned them, you've beat them, you've ridiculed them, you've done everything against them when I've tried to reach you and speak to them. But these people are dull of hearing and their eyes are blind to the truth, as it says, right? And then as we go, um, Jesus says in verse 42, Did you never read the scriptures, the stone which the builders rejected, the same has become the head of the corner? This is the Lord's doing, and it is marvelous in our eyes. Therefore say I unto you, 
The kingdom of God shall be taken from you and given to a nation bringing forth the fruits thereof. That's an important point because this actually shows you what the wild grapes represent, what we just talked about. Because they rejected. And then a nation bringing forth the fruits. And what, what is this fruit? I guess we could go to Matthew 7 real quick and see what this fruit is. John the Baptist. Actually, I don't think that. No, that's not John the Baptist. Not yet. Matthew 7, verse 18 to 20. Verses 18 to 20. A good tree cannot bring forth evil fruit, neither can a corrupt tree bring forth good fruit. Every tree that brings not forth good fruit is hewn down and cast into the fire. And he makes the point, wherefore, by their fruits you shall know them. So by their fruits you shall know them. So when a husbandman, you know, uh, the dresser of the vineyard, as the Bible refers to it, Jesus is that husbandman. He's come to his, as he says, he sent his well-beloved son to kind of to, to, to bring forth a harvest, to inspect the fruits. And of course, we slew him, right? But Jesus is here to inspect the fruit of his vineyard. And uh, unfortunately, it's, it, it hasn't been a good fruit, <laughs> uh, what, he, what he would have preferred, right? Um, and what is the fruit of the Spirit? Galatians 5 but the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance. Against such there is no law. Galatians 5, 22 and 23. So, but what was the response of the Jews in the time of Christ? What did they, what did they say? Well, we're Abraham's seed. We're children of the promise. So when you hear children of the promise, I just said it, but who do you think of? What promise is, are they referring to? Abraham. Yeah, the covenant he made with Abraham. We are children of the promise because we are children, descendants of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. So let's see, let's explore this a bit. Luke chapter 3. Luke chapter 3 and verses 7 to 8. This is John the Baptist. He's addressing the multitude and he says this. In verse 7 of chapter 3, Luke. Then said he to the multitude that came forth to be baptized of him, O generation of vipers, who hath warned you to flee from the wrath to come? Bring forth therefore fruits worthy of repentance, and begin not to say within yourself, We have Abraham to our father. For I say unto you that God is able of these stones to raise up children, unto Abraham. And now also the axe is laid unto the root of the trees. Every tree, therefore, which bringeth not forth good fruit is hewn down and cast into the fire. You see a parallel there? So it's, it's all about the fruits that we bear. It's not, we can't just pride ourselves in saying, well, I'm a descendant of Abraham, so I can live and do whatever I want to do. In fact, Jesus will tell us, you are of your father the devil. He was a liar and a murderer from the beginning. Because if we, if we profess, if we take God's name in vain, and we take upon ourselves the name of Christian or a believer in, in Jesus, and we live a lifestyle contrary to that, well, that's taking God's name in vain, uh -huh. right? So, more on this, Romans chapter 9. <clears throat> the children of promise. Let's see what... Paul has to say. Paul speaks a lot on these things. Obviously, he, he knew quite well firsthand the, the situation, the controversy at hand. So chapter 9 of Romans, we're going to read verses 3 to 8. Please follow along, and if you have any thoughts, questions, please let us know. And so he, he goes into this... Um, Starting in verse 2, I guess. That, that I have great heaviness in my, in my, and continual sorrow in my heart. So he's going to express his heart here. For I could wish that myself were accursed from Christ for my brethren, my kinsmen according to the flesh. So what is he saying here? He's kind of pulling a Moses. When Moses is talking with God and God says, step aside, Moses. I'm going to restart with, with you. And he says, no, but blot my name out of the book of life 
and let Israel live before you, right? Uh, Paul's kind of having a similar experience here where I wish I could curse myself from Christ for the sake of my brethren, according to the flesh, who are the Jews, right? The Jewish nation. So that's how much he loves them and how much he cares for them. So verse 4, who are Israelites to whom pertain the adoption and the glory and the covenants and the giving of the law and the service of God and the promises. And all those things are wonderful, aren't they? They're beautiful. They're, it's, it was a ministration um, of, well, of life to those who would receive it. But then verse 5 says, Whose are the fathers and of whom as concerning the flesh Christ came, who is over all God blessed forever. Amen. So what is he saying there? Jesus came as a Jew. He came to his own. And if, we'll, we'll look at that verse. And his own received him not, right? Um, hmm. this, is a, this is a whole uh, a, a, a remedy to the pedagogue of life here. <laughs> in that verse. All in, pretty much. Uh, what do you mean by that? Adoption, identity, glory, character, covenant. I see, yeah. Being a love status. <laughs> yeah, that's true. That's good. Verse 4, yeah, I see what you're saying. Okay, so let's continue. Verse 6. Not as though the word of God has taken none effect, for they, this is the important point, they are not all Israel, which are of Israel. Okay? Neither because they are the seed of Abraham are they all children, but in Isaac shall thy seed be called. That is, they which are the children of the flesh, these are not the children of God, but the children of the promise are counted for the seed. So, I mean, it's pretty clear, right? The, the physical, Jesus says, the flesh profits nothing, but the spirit giveth life. If you are a, even a direct descendant, like, I mean, from Isaac, from, from, from Jacob, like, even look at Jacob's sons. Like, I hope to see them in the kingdom. I hope they repented, but their life was a life of... The branches were cut off. Oh, yeah. Yes, they were. They were cut off. They cut themselves off from the prince of life, you know, through their sin. So the idea is, you know, it's a, it's a spiritual relationship. God is able to raise up stones or raise up children of Abraham from stones, as it says, um, symbolically, of course. But uh, another one on this topic, the children of promise, Hebrews 4.2. And this is an important text because this is, a, a, this is the epistle to the Hebrews, appealing to them. Uh, so Hebrews 4, verse 2. He's including himself in this letter because he says, For unto us, being a Jew, Paul being a Jew of Jews, for unto us was the gospel preached, as well as unto them. Who is them here? The Jews. The Jews you know, this, this, yes, the descendants of Abraham. Um, but guess what happened? The word, did, the word preached to them did not profit them because it was not mixed with faith, in them that heard it. So if you're a physical descendant, but you have not faith, that makes you what? Not an heir to the promise, right? An heir to the promise, you have to have it mingled with faith. Okay? And I want to transition to circumcision, because the circumcision was the sign, right? The sign of the covenant, the blood covenant that God made with Abraham. This is a really important uh, understanding, I believe. So, go to Genesis chapter 15, where it all begins. <clears throat> Genesis 15. I'm just going to read verses 5 to 8. And I, I just want to bring us through a series of thoughts here so we can see clearly what kind of how God was working with Abraham, like what was the purpose and the sequence of events here um, that happened. So 15, 5 to 8. And he brought him forth abroad and said, Look now toward heaven and tell the stars if you be able to number them. And he said unto him, So shall thy seed be. And verse 6 is beautiful. And he believed in the Lord and he counted it to him for righteousness. And he said unto him, I am the Lord that brought you out of out of Ur of Chaldees, to give you this land to inherit it. 
But Abraham makes a pretty severe mistake right here. In the next verse, he says, Lord God, whereby shall I know that I shall inherit it? But Jesus says, a wicked generation seeks a sign. Abraham here is seeking a sign. So your word is good and all, but it's not quite good enough. Can you show me a sign that will prove to me that your word will come to pass, that I will inherit this land? So I believe that this is, in a, in a way, a breach for Abraham, which opened up some, we know the story. Um, mm -hmm. So in, verse, in chapter 16, we have, of course, Hagar given to Abraham to, become a, uh, to be a wife and to have Ishmael. And of course, he goes through, Lord, that Ishmael might live before you, you know. So he took it into his own hands, the work of, of God, and he didn't let God do his part, right? Um, so we know that pretty well, hopefully. But I want to go to Genesis 17, 10 to 11. Because notice, when God made the promise to Abraham, it was according to God's promise. But then we have a compromise on Abraham's part. And then we have... Then we have the entrance of the, the ceremony of circumcision. This is a very important part. So 17, 10 to 11. This is my covenant, which you shall keep between me and you and thy seed after thee. This is God speaking. Every man child among you shall be circumcised and you shall circumcise the flesh of your foreskin. Listen to this. And it shall be a token, which is a sign of the covenant between me and you. So, yes, yes. Well, what is this sign, Lord? Well, wicked and adulterous generations seek after a sign. We can make you a sign. You <laughs> like that? Oh, so circumcision, I believe, was an accommodation yes. for um, Abraham's lack of faith mm -hmm. and taking things into his own hand. So God had to very visually and painfully and bloodily demonstrate the need to cast off the flesh, the works of our own hands, from ourselves, so that we can know that God um, uh, requires, you know, simple, childlike obedience. And so, you know, we see Abraham make that compromise, and we, then the circumcision enters into, into this covenant. It, it, was, it became a blood covenant at this point. So anyways, it's, it's, um, there's a lot there, but... So let's continue looking at this circumcision. Uh, Romans 2. Oh, no. Yes, sir, of course. Please. There was another evidence that this was an accommodation and not God's ideal will was the fact that in the New Testament we find that Paul shows that this is not required for new believers. For Gentile believers coming in, it was not required that they do right. this. God always wanted the circumcision of the heart. It was never about the flesh. That was an accommodation. It was really old covenant type of thing. Yeah. I agree. So if we're in the new covenant, there's no, what's the purpose of doing the old covenant sign if you're yeah. living in the new covenant? Yeah. Yeah. You yeah. move from physical to spiritual. Exactly. Mm -hmm. yeah. Visible to invisible. Yes. Yeah. yeah. He wanted them to embrace the spiritual but they rejected it. Right. Amen. Thank you. Yeah, that's, that's human nature. We always want to see something. We always want to, uh, and you know, that's the problem with idols. That's the problem with idols. They set up idols to worship them because, well, we can see this idol. It represents something special to us. When God says, I, I dwell not in temples made with hands, you know, God is invisible who alone hath immortality. So men really like, we really like the visible. And so God does give us vis visible illustrations to teach us invisible truth. Sabrina. It's just so ironic that the, the very sign that God gave them to remind them that the flesh profits nothing, they ended up turning into a means of trusting in their flesh for salvation. Yep. Right. Yep. You have to be circumcised in order to be saved. Yep. So like, this is really sad. Yeah. Well, you have women to be saved. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, exactly. Well, the Muslims sure try. Yeah. yeah, mercy. Yeah, I wonder what the history of that is, if there's a correlation. But the sort of sex to women, like, not all. Yeah, it's not all. Okay. Uh, Rome, uh, Romans chapter 2. <clears throat> So 
So we're just going to keep learning who is the true Israel of God. Who represents God's true Israel. Um, okay, Paul speaks on the circumcision. Chapter 2, 26 to 29. 26 to 29. Okay, he says pretty plainly, Therefore, if the circumcision... If, sorry, therefore, if the uncircumcision, meaning those who are uncircumcised, keep the righteousness of the law, shall not his uncircumcision be counted for circumcision? And shall not uncircumcision, which is by nature, if it fulfill the law, judge thee, who by the letter and circumcision, who by the letter and circumcision does transgress the law? Sometimes King James is a little tedious, but... 28, for he is not a Jew... This is important. He is not a Jew which is one outwardly. Neither is that circumcision which is outward in the flesh. But he is a Jew which is one inwardly. And circumcision is that of the heart, in the spirit, and not of the letter, whose praise is not of men, but of God. So for me, like, this makes sense, right? This really does make sense. Like Paul here speaking boldly and, 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 you know, about this subject because, if, okay, if God really was that arbitrary, there'd be some, I would have concerns. You know, if he was really like, okay, well, you can, uh, you're my child, you're my covenant people, if you have this specific thing. You know, it was, it's always been about the heart. God has always been trying to reach the heart. He's, he's speaking to what you had shared with us in the prophets. He has the authority of the prophets. He was a Jew. This isn't a Gentile trying to deceive people and they're saying, oh, that's Jews, Torah, the Old Testament. That's all, that's all garbage. Don't follow that. Yeah, you know, exactly. And he, he walked in the statutes and judgments. Yeah. You know, Paul would have said the same thing. Don't think I come to destroy the law and the prophets. Yeah. I came to show how Christ fulfilled them. You know, he walked in his father's, in his father's judgments and statutes. So, and Paul has that distinction that he always makes between the spirit and the letter, yeah. else where he says the letter kills, mm -hmm. and it, it's in the spirit that we're made alive. So the right. letter kills, so it's usually right stuff down and we're thinking, I can do this, I can do this. Yeah. I'm reading it and I can do this. That we're dead already. We're dead Amen. Already. Yeah, all the Lord has said that we will do. So, you know, it's it's a common thing and the that's where interesting covenants comes in because the majority of the Christian world, they believe, oh, Jesus came, he died, we're in the new covenant. We don't have to worry about any of that stuff in the past. That's all, like, that was to Israel. But they don't realize that um, anyone who has the mindset that, that they can perform God's will without dying to self, without the newness of the Spirit of Christ resurrecting us into newness of life, we're... Everyone's in the Old Covenant. And I would say everyone born on this earth is born into an, an Old Covenant experience, which they need to die to and, and have a New Covenant experience in Christ, if that makes sense. Donnie? Yeah. Yeah. Sure. So if we're not keeping the Sabbath spiritually, we're not keeping the Sabbath. Exactly. It's the truth. Yeah, that, and that's, that's a good point, Carter, because a lot of you know, people say, well, oh, you start you know, keeping the Sabbath, you're going to start keeping the feast. You have to keep all 613, is it, you know, laws. And it's like you don't, you don't realize that it's not about the letter. It's about the spirit behind the letter, mm -hmm. right? These aren't things we have to do and mm -hmm. we do, and then we're going to be saved. These are gifts, blessings from God that He has just totally poured out on us in His love to edify us, give us the spiritual understanding of what Amen. they're all about. But if we don't have the spiritual side of it, just, just old covenant crap. Yeah, right. yeah. Well, I notice how the Sabbath, the long Sabbath spirit that is being criticized, is then immediately transferred to Sunday keeping, yes. where a lot of Sunday keepers turn right around and do the same thing that they're criticizing in Sabbath keepers and mm -hmm. they're proud of their Sunday keeping. They judge other people mm -hmm. who don't keep the Sunday 
Yeah. We're, trying to, that we're trying to earn our salvation. Right. They think <laughs> that the world would be a better place if everybody went to church on Sunday. No. So it's the same exact thing. They're, they're criticizing and sabotaging, yeah. and they transfer that to Sunday teaching. It's called mm-hmm. legalism. So God prefers uh, illegalism, right? I'd rather it be illegal than legal. <laughs> Yeah, that's a, that's the that's the profound thing about God's law is it is not an arbitrary set of rules. It is a hedge of protection uh, to to help us to stay with its guardrails so that we might not fall off into the path of sin and be destroyed by the destroyer, right? Yeah, Jesus says that's what the world right is all about. How to love God and how to love us. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Look at verse 29 at the end the end of this uh, verse Whose praise is not of men, but of God. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, because Jesus said they have their reward. You know, they they fast in this, they anoint their head with ash, and they make themselves look like this. They pray in public, and he says they have their reward. They have their praise of men. They're doing all the things they think re- God requires. Um, but yeah, let us let us have praise of God, not of men. Um, it's much more rewarding, isn't it? Malcolm, I was just thinking about churches today who are quick to criticize the Jews for relying on this physical sign of, of being God's people, the circumcision. You know, and so they, the, the, the Pharisees, you know, especially the Judaizers that, that had professed acceptance mm-hmm. of Messiah were going around, and the more Gentiles they got to get Circumcised. circumcised. That, that was, you know, they could report it. I got ten Gentiles to be circumcised, you know. By like collecting scalps. Collecting yes, portions. yes. But it reminds me of these churches that think if I just get them dumped under the water and come out, I, you know, I had ten baptisms last year. Well, yeah, it's no different. You're taking yeah, you're exactly. confidence in the flesh. Exactly, yes. Thank you. Yeah. I think baptism are baptisms of doctrine, not necessarily. Most into Christ, most they often were, that's they, true. They were, they, were, they were dunked, buried alive, buried alive. Mm-hmm. Sabrina? Um, yeah, I think maybe just in considering with, with God's law, you know, we need to understand context, we need to sometimes understand what what is meant to be a blessing mm-hmm. for us, because the Sabbath was given as a pure gift at creation, all of mankind, but we see like circumcision as an example. It was given because of a breach in Abraham's life right. to basically correct him for a mistake he had made um, and to per, you know perpetually remind him of that mistake. Mm-hmm. Um, kind of help him to redirect his you know mind to God and his promises. So um, yeah, and drive from yeah. the ditch. Jesus said that. So was Ishmael circumcised? Mm-hmm. Yes. Mm-hmm. He was. Okay. Donnie. But at the end of the day, when you read all the scriptures together, and what what settles in the bottom of the cup is that he does he, he wants a relationship with you, but it's not because you're circumcised. He wants a relationship with you, not because you're keeping the Sabbath, but because God's keeping the Sabbath, mm-hmm. or keeping the Jews. He wants to he, he wants to come into relationship with you because of your heart. Mm-hmm. And from then, from that relationship, he, he, that relationship will dictate how you bond. And then mm-hmm. when you do something, it's because out of gratitude for him, mm-hmm. not out of respect for him. Mm-hmm. Yeah. There's, a, there's the spiritual circumcision. It's the heart. The, the heart. heart. Because God is our Father. God's kingdom is a relational kingdom. If it's not a relational kingdom, then God the Father is not a true Father. Mm-hmm. His Son is not a true Son. And if Jesus isn't a true son, then neither are we, right? There's, that's a solemn situation there. Mm-hmm. I see something else there, and that is that continual doubt that Abram had when he laughed at, you know, secretly laughed at stuff that he said. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> it's like, uh, I don't believe that for a moment. Can you show me? hundred years old? Yeah. Yeah, really. uh, yeah, whatever you say, Lord, that's nonsense. Yeah. Oh, and because if God had wanted men to not have foreskins, he could have easily made men right. not have foreskins. So it's not that God needs men 
to correct something he uh, did wrong right. in the anatomy previously. And I think that's important to remember that God does not need our help in his creation. Mm. It, it was already perfect the way it was, and the only thing we need to agree with and help with and, and come in alignment with is faith in him, not trying to correct his creation. Thank you. All right, let's move on a little bit. Um, thank you so much. That was a blessing. Um, but, you know, when it all boils down to God is our Father, honor your father and mother. You know, when your father shares something with you and, and it's a blessing, then we shouldn't, we shouldn't question it. I mean, he wants us to reason together and understand why we do things and whatnot, but um, it should be obedience out of love. Amen. So we read, where we were, Romans 2? 28. And then, okay. 28. Yeah, I think we finished that, actually. We read to 29, I believe, right? Yeah. So let's go to Galatians 5. Galatians 5, 6. And this is the same chapter with the fruit of the Spirit. But Galatians 5, 6 says, For in Jesus Christ neither circumcision avails anything nor uncircumcision, but faith which worketh by love. Remember Hebrews 4, 2, he says that um, it was preached to them, but it was not mingled with faith to them that heard it. So for us, if it's mingled with faith, if we hear the, the gospel preached, the faith that works by love, and of course, we have the fruit of the Spirit here later on. And that's ultimately what it is because what God's trying to say is don't look at all the outward show and appeal and pomp and pride and, and, and supposed righteousness. Look at the fruit. By their fruits you shall know them. Is this the truth? Well, we should, ins we should be fruit inspectors. And we don't want to judge. You know, We don't need to enter into judgment and, and think that we know everyone's secret little details and things like that and be like, well, he's a professor, this and that, you know, but, or even father, son believers, you know, there's a lot of issues and a lot of people could inspect, you know, that fruit from, from our movement and, uh, you know, not come up with a good result. So of course there's also, you have to really test the spirit and the letter and, and see how God leads you there. Yeah. Wayne first. Yeah. Uh, this text, neither circumcision nor uncircumcision avails anything. It reminds me of something Adrian said, which I had never considered before. Often those of us that keep God's seventh-day Sabbath are accused of being legalists for keeping God's law. So you don't have faith in, in, the, the, you know, in Christ's righteousness. You're trusting in your own righteousness because you're keeping the Sabbath. Yeah. And Adrian brought out the point that... Right. That, that Sunday keepers <laughs> are proving that they have faith in Christ by not, by not keeping the Sabbath. Yeah, that was my point. <laughs> it's just, it's just that, 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 that was what... That, hmm, interesting. It, it's still a yeah. form of works. Yeah. Totally. And, and that's what Paul is saying here. <laughs> if, oh. if you're trusting in your own circumcision to, show, to prove that you mm. have faith, but you... Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's right. Yeah. So it works. Yeah. It is interesting. This, this verse Malcolm also showed, it, it's the formula for how we're obedient through love. He said, we're obedient out of love. This verse says it right there. Faith works by love. So we're obedient through faith, which comes by love. Yeah. It comes from God. Who is love? The faith of Jesus yeah. works obedience in us. Yeah. Mm -hmm. God is love. Yeah. Uh, if you love me, keep my commandments. Okay, and then Galatians 6.15, just turn one, or actually, it's on the same page for me. Uh, 6.15, for in Christ Jesus, neither circumcision availeth anything, nor uncircumcision, but a new creature. So he just reiterates the same point um, to drive it home as he leaves the Galatians with a very uh, beautiful letter, but has been, which one has been quite controversial over the ages. Um, so thankful for that. Okay, 1 Corinthians 15. That's good. You should, don't e forget I said anything. <laughs> three and four, yeah, yeah, especially three and four. First really? Corinthians. Yeah. Galatians is one of my favorite letters by Paul. First Corinthians fifteen fifty. Yeah, it says in the battle ground in ninety six. All right, fifteen fifty. 
Now this I say, brethren, that flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God, neither doth incorruption inherit corruption. Backwards. Sorry, incorruption. So, but, you know, the principle he's laying down here is flesh and blood cannot in inherit the kingdom of God, right? You have Jesus saying that, you know, the flesh profits nothing. I think it's in John 6. But the spirit, right? So the flesh doesn't profit anything. So you who think that you're doing things outwardly, that it gains merit, um, it doesn't. So I know I've quoted a lot from Mr. Paul, um, but I want to now turn to some verses uh, under, the, under the term, no respecter of persons. God is not a respecter of persons. Yeah. So this was said by Moses, by Samuel, by David, by Solomon, by Luke, by Paul, by James, and by Peter. So, and probably others that I'm missing. Whoever wrote Second Chronicles, do you know who wrote Second Chronicles? It was a compilation that Ezra, we believe, put together. So, <clears throat> I'm just going to give you one uh, here uh, that kind of uh, includes two of them. Uh, this is Acts 10, 34 to 35. Acts 10, 34 to 35. So this is Luke writing Acts. So he was one of, uh, actually he was not an, uh, an apostle. but um, So Luke says 10, and this is of course his testimony of the event. 10, 34 to 35. Then Peter, so Peter's opening his mouth here, and said, Of a truth, I perceive that God is no respecter of persons, but in every nation he that feareth him and worketh righteousness is accepted with him. Amen. Right. So, yeah, that's a, that's a good... Who is God's true Israel? Well, I would say that verse could be an easy conclusion. But in every nation... Him that fears him and works righteousness is accepted with him. Amen. Because God is no respecter of persons. Like I said, this is in Moses' writings. This is in Samuel's writings, David's writings, Solomon. Of course, Luke here. Paul says it many times in many ways. James and Peter. Um, let's see. God is not a racist. Exactly. He's not racist. And so like, if we establish that principle and we see it like firmly rooted... Um, you do have to go back in time a little bit because it appears that God has a special people, you know, the Israelites. And were, this, were the Israelites special? Of course they were. Johnny showed us the verse as to why they were special because they're descendants of Abraham. They're pe God made a promise to Abraham who was his friend. Abraham believed him. Mm -hmm. So the new covenant, God said, this is what I'll do for you. This is why they're special because of what he said to Abraham. Thank you. Cool. Thank you. Yeah. So... Um, God's concept of Israel was the same from the beginning. Mm -hmm. They yeah. just yes. didn't fulfill it. Thank you. Yeah. And on the contrary, with God not being a racist, we naturally are racist. We are prejudiced against others. We always tend to think that our race, our gender, our group, our fellowship, our little home church is better than everybody else. That is just the natural consequence of being a human being. We think that we are superior to others. When God in reality is no respecter of persons, he's not, he's colorblind. He is, you know, he doesn't see that. He loves all men equally. And it's a beautiful truth because if he doesn't, then woe to me, you know, because <laughs> I'm probably not his favorite in that case. So, and, and woe to anyone else who's a minority or things like that. But God loves to look at the heart and see a faith willing to believe his word. That's what he's looking for. Remember, it says Noah found grace in, in the Lord's eyes. It's because he, had, he believed that the Lord uh, could help him and, and that he, he saw grace in the Lord. So it's beautiful. He saw that the Lord was gracious, I should say. Okay, uh, we're pretty much wrapping things up here, but just a few more points. Uh, Romans 10. We'll go back to Romans briefly. <clears throat> 12 to 
12 to 13. Romans 10, 12 to 13. For there is no difference between the Jew and the Greek. For the same Lord over all is rich unto all that call upon him. For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. The grace of God is appearing to all men. Yeah. And Paul said, if this, if, he says, if any man preach any other gospel than that I've preached to you, he is accursed. And so we don't want to preach another gospel that excludes some people from receiving the promise. Because ultimately we're saying we're better than them. And that is also a sign of outward works. So, in, in, in of the flesh. Okay, I should have probably just stayed in Acts and then stayed in Romans. But Acts 17, just flip back there. We'll have some good arm exercise today. Continuing, of course, Johnny had us going also. Yep, exactly. As it says in Daniel... The time of the end, many knowledge shall increase and men shall run to and fro <laughs> through the scriptures. Yeah. So Acts 17, 26 to 28. Here Paul is in Athens speaking to the Greeks. And he says in 26, uh, well, kind of backing up a little bit, um, you know, that verse I quoted earlier, God is not worshipped with men's hands as though he needed anything, seeing he giveth life to all and breath and all things and has made of one blood all nations of men to d for to dwell on the face of the earth and has determined the times before appointed and the bounds of their habitation that they should seek the Lord if haply they might feel after him and find him though he be not far from every one of us. Mm -hmm. For in him we live and move and have our being, as certain also of your own poets have said, for we are also his offspring. So he's talking to the Greeks here, who are Gentiles, and he's including them in this one blood. God is made of one blood, all nations. Um, in him we live, all men live and move and have our being. And it says we are his offspring. He's saying we are his children, Greeks, Jews, all the Gentiles included, right? So I think that's a really beautiful point there. Uh, and I just want to look briefly now, and this kind of ties back to the beginning. I kind of went a little spiel and said about Israel and physical Israel, turning your eyes to physical Israel. And here's where we need to be careful. This is the consequences of rejecting the Son of God. Come with me to John chapter 1. This is a solemn, uh, this will be a solemn line of, of scriptures here for us. John chapter 1 verse 11. <clears throat> it says, He came unto his own, and his own received him not. So, that's, that breaks God's heart, ultimately. God loved his, his children in Israel. That's Isaiah 5. What more could I do than what has been done? And remember John 3.16, For God so loved the whole world, he gave his only son. Right? Donnie. Some of the scriptures when they said that, they came unto his own. He's talking about Judah. Judah is the king of the line. He wasn't like from Ephraim side of the family, so that we could see, we could understand Judah's rejection. Mm -hmm. Okay. Interesting. Yeah, for, certainly, like, you could go into that route for sure. I think that applies. But I think, generally speaking, you could apply it to the Jews in, as a whole. And you can also apply it to the whole world. He came to his own, and his own right. received him not. He came to all men. You know, God still loved the world, right? You skipped right over. Yeah, so I meant the Jews, yeah. The, yeah. That's why Israel was more than just the, the Jews. Yeah, true. But you are, uh, I'm assuming, going to embrace this, or I know you're on it. You still have to be grafted into Israel to become part That's of right. the Israel of God. That's right. But it's not physical Israel. Yeah. It's the yeah. true yes. Israel. Yes. Spiritual Israel. Unless yeah. we acknowledge the promises that God made to Abraham, as Diane's pointing out, and Moses alluded to, were not of. 
so everybody goes in the, one of the 12 gates which have the name of the 12. So you've got to be a member of one of the 12 tribes to enter into one of the gates. And the 144,000, 12,000 from each tribe. So that's kind of another point that we could look at. But, you know, personally, I don't see that being a literal meaning, but rather a symbolic meaning. And um, otherwise, God would, would still be arbitrary in that sense, where he makes the bloodline and the circumcision prominent, right? It's the bloodline, it's the character. Yeah, it's the character, it's, it's the heart of faith. So, yeah, that's, you know, some people believe that it is literally, literally 12,000 from each tribe of the, of the tribes of, of Israel. So. All the physical in the Old Testament is symbolic of the spiritual. Right. We, we right, need yeah. to embrace the spiritual. We learn from the physical, but we don't keep looking through physical eyes. Thank you, thank you. So, when the term Jew... Is that specifically referring to Judah? Technically, that's, yes. That's interesting. Yeah. <laughs> that's where it comes from. It makes sense. Jew is a descendant. Yeah. Of he is what a true Jew was in, in Romans 2. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Originally physically, though. Yeah, for sure. It's just, it's just interesting that they kind of, they, they single out like Judah. Yeah. Like I'm, I'm like as if there's like some, maybe honestly that was a fight for, oh, this is interesting. Think about this. If they knew that the Messiah was coming, like the great king was coming from the, tr- the line of Judah, everyone would want to be a Jew, and they would, they would pride themselves greatly in that because we're from, we're from royal line, you know? And so that was, yeah, okay, interesting. Thank you. Okay. Uh, Maybe his bride, the kings and priests of the rule and reign with him, will be grafted into the tribe of the spiritual tribe of Judah. Amen. Matthew 21, Matthew 21, verses 18 to 20. So the context of this, this is where the fig tree is withered. Jesus speaks to the tree and it it becomes withered. The context before is Jesus cleanses the temple and the Pharisees have some strong words to say to him. Um, So he's feeling that rejection of of the leaders, of the Jews, right? And then, let's see, uh, Jesus, the fig tree is withered. And then immediately after, um, you have the parable of the vineyard, which we started with in the parable of the two sons. So it's this, this story that we're about to read is sandwiched in between two um, clear rejections of God's son. So let's see what the consequences of rejecting the son of God is. Matthew 21, 18 to 20. Now in the morning, as he returned into the city, he, hu- he was hungry And when he saw a fig tree in the way, he came to it and found nothing thereon, but only leaves and said unto it, let no fruit ever on you henceforth forever grow. (laughs) Yeah. And presently the fig tree withered away. And when his disciples saw it, they marveled saying, how soon is the fig tree withered away? So who does this represent? Israel. I believe that, yeah, it represents Israel. And the rejection of the Son of God and the consequences of rejecting the Son of God. And the, we will come to him and say, Lord, Lord, did I not do this? Did I not do that? He says, depart from me. I never knew you. It's a similar, you know, um, experience that this fig tree had. So, uh, even more solemn, Matthew 23, turn the page. And Matthew 23, 37 to 38. All right, 37 to 38, Matthew 23. O Jerusalem, Jerusalem, you who kill the prophets and stone them which are sent to you, how often would I have gathered your children together, even as a hen gathered her chickens under her wings, and you would not. Behold, your house is left unto you desolate. For I say unto you, you shall not see me henceforth till they say, Blessed is he that cometh in the name of the Lord. So the consequences of rejecting Christ is what? Our house being left unto you desolate. Remember in the beginning when I said, uh, you know, people refer to the Israel as, oh, I went and visited the Holy Land. Yeah. You know, I brought back some souvenirs and some trinkets. It says the Holy Land, you know. What makes a place holy? The presence of God. The presence of God. So 
You know, when, when he says, your house is left unto you desolate, desolate of what? God's spirit. God's spirit. And that's super sad, super solemn. But, um, and of course we see, uh, I'll just quote this, you know, whenever Jesus was being crucified, it says that, the, that the, the people cried out and said, His blood be upon us and our children. Crucify Him. We'll take the consequences. That's really a terrible mindset, right? Because His blood was upon them and His children. But, um, and we saw what happens in 70 AD. The whole city was destroyed. Every, every person remaining in that city was, was pretty much killed. But I want to leave you with something of the consequences of believing on the Son of God. Because we have, an, uh, we have a choice. We can reject Him and face those consequences, or we can receive Him and accept those consequences. So John five twenty four. This will be our last verse. John 5, 24. <clears throat> verily, verily, I say unto you, he that hears my word and believes on him, the Father that sent me, hath everlasting life and shall not come into condemnation, but is passed from death unto life. Amen. You might say, well, that's believing on the Father, but when you believe on the Father, you believe on his Son, because to believe on the Son is to believe in the Father. What, we, what might we do to do the works of God? Believe on him whom he has sent. Right? So it's beautiful. So, and, and with this, I just want to say that this, the same noble and high and profound calling that God had on Israel of old is not to just be cast by the wayside, but rather be renewed and refreshed by the Holy Spirit of God in our lives. That same calling that he had upon Israel of old to be refreshed and renewed into our own experience. And it's an important point I want to leave with you is that you, each of us, we are being called to be that, what is it, um, chosen generation, royal priesthood, uh, holy nation, um, peculiar people. We are the ones, you and I, who are to lighten the world with the glory of God. We've read books, we've heard testimonies of people, of men, women, and children doing amazing, wonderful, marvelous things for God, and we just get so excited. But you need to realize that those individuals were no more qualified, more special, more prepared to do those things than you and I here are. So my point here is that you are special. You are an amazing child of God, and He wants to do mighty exploits through you. The problem is, is our unbelief. We think that we're not special. And so I just want to encourage you that, you know, God wants to bless you and he wants to use you. And even though we're like, oh, I'm just a common Joe, I'm just this guy over here. Well, just wait, you know, seek God with all your heart, lean not upon your own understanding and all your ways acknowledge him and he will direct your paths. And that path will be a glorious, beautiful, powerful uh, manifestation of the gospel in your life, in your family, in your community and eventually the whole world. So that's what I'll leave with you. We can close with a prayer. Amen. Amen. <clears throat> Father, we're so happy to know that you love us and that we are your special children and that we are precious to you and you want to take us in your arms and you want to bless us, especially on the Sabbath, Father, when um, we come apart from our secular toils and duties and we just get to rest and sit on your lap and just hear your in faith hear your voice like it says in Ze uh, uh, Zephaniah where you will sing over us with joy rejoicing father we just pray that we'd have this experience each and every moment and that you would use us and that you would call us higher and higher father we want to fulfill that marvelous and that beautiful plan that you had for Israel of old and we know father that they in many ways failed but it's not because of you, it's because of our unbelief. And we pray that you would raise up um, the true Israel of God, that we would stand at the 144,000 who are numbered of the 12 tribes of Israel, that we would just uh, seek your face, Father, and uh, we would be lightened with, uh, you would lighten us 
with your glory that we might lighten this world, that you might write your name upon our foreheads, put your spirit upon our hearts. And may we walk in newness of life in Christ Jesus. And we thank you for blessing our fellowship. And as we uh, just conclude this session, we just pray your blessing on us. We ask this in your son's name. Amen. Amen. What's that?